Will Kane Show begins in one minute. One, the growing political divide between men and women. Is it wrong? Was it racist for Mark Cuban to say that 30 black women would share the same opinion? And what Fox News host would you guess would be the most likely to take his shirt off at a football game? A big episode of Will and Pete, my co-host from Fox and Friends Weekend, Pete Hegseth. Two, the free market will kill Title IX the biggest threat to women's sports. Three, what should we do about Congresswoman Ilhan Omar? Somali first, we'll ask Congressman Chip Roy. It is the Will Kane Show, streaming live at foxnews.com and on the Fox News YouTube channel. You can always get this show on demand wherever you get your audio entertainment, at Apple, Spotify, or at Fox News Podcast. You can catch clips of our exclusive interviews, our panels, our debates at Will Kane Show on YouTube. You can also check us out on Facebook. It streams live at the Fox News Facebook page and available at the Will Kane page on Facebook. We intend to be everywhere and anywhere you consume your entertainment. On X, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and at foxnews.com. Not everybody travels as often as I do. And I'm fully aware that you can dive in and get sucked into the rabbit hole debates about what boarding group should stand closest to the line or whether or not you should help a woman put her extremely overweight and extra large carry-on bag in the overhead bin. Not everyone lives with it like I do weekly, but it still presents opportunities to discuss the clash that is humanity. The other day, I was flying through Dallas Love Field Airport, and I was going through TSA security, and I had gone through the metal detector, and I was waiting for my bag to come through the x-ray machine, and there was a man older than me, probably more distinguished, dressed more appropriately for travel, at least were this 1960, and I looked at him, and there he was sitting there with his fly down. And I made eye contact with him and I just kind of gave him one of these with my index finger up, up, you know, no words. And he stood and stared at me for a good five seconds. And then he got the man cue. Why is this guy pointing up, up to me? And he knew that his fly was down. And in that moment, however awkward, no matter if he were a billionaire, I had him right at that moment. I have him on the pecking order. And I did the right thing. You know, I think that was a courteous thing to to extend to this gentleman. Hey, man, your fly's down. But at the same time, it is completely emasculating. Like, if you're on the other end of that courtesy, you are kind of indebted. And, and you are sort of a serf to my fiefdom. There's no way for him to feel above me in that moment, right? No matter if he's a billionaire or he's the president of the United States. Hey, man, your fly's down. It's a weird thing where at the same time, it is both insulting and courteous. I thought that might be a good place to jump off with story number one. 
He is my co-host on Fox and Friends Weekend. He is my co-host on Off the Wall, a segment within Fox and Friends Weekend. He is my friend, and he is Pete Hegseth. You tell another dude when his fly's down? Okay, I, I was with you until pecking order. See, I don't see anything about that interaction that puts the teller above the receiver uh, in any sort of power dynamic. I just don't. I think oh. it's only courage to show courtesy. It's not easy to tell another man that his flies down. It's not. It takes a it you you've got to be have a level of maturity and confidence yourself in order to do that. Even to a friend of yours, at first, that's even more difficult, let alone a stranger. I don't know that I would have done what you did. Maybe you're more powerful than me in that context uh, <laughs> or, more, or more courteous. I, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I just think when, you, when you're told that, the only feeling I've had, which I've been told by friends, uh, not really strangers. I don't know that I've ever had a stranger tell me, is appreciation. I'm just grateful to be hooked up uh, in, that, in that. And, you know, you mentioned off the wall in the segment we do together. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I'm, I'm sure you haven't. But every time we do that segment, the last thing I do two seconds before we go on air is check my fly. Because I realize we're really? standing up. Yes, every time. <laughs> just uh, check the tape. Just glance over one time. It's a fly check. Because I've been known to leave my fly down. And the person that tells me <laughs> most often is my wife right here. And it's very – It's I appreciate her telling me, but that probably – emasculates me the most because I realize she thinks I look foolish. I'm insulted if someone does not tell me that my fly is down. It's like having something in your teeth. Why would you let me walk around with that in my teeth? A friend, but the thing though, about the fly friend, is... A friend. You don't, you don't look around at a group of strangers and be like, why hasn't anyone told me that? Yeah, if, you, not if with, I didn't tell you for an hour, you'd take issue with me. For sure. But not with the teeth. I don't want a, f a stranger saying, hey, man, you got something in your teeth. But no. if you're walking around with your fly down, I, I think that is a common courtesy to say among dudes, your fly is down. But I think it is this moment where he is overcome by a, a little bit of shame and embarrassment. And because of that, I'm full of confidence. And I think at that moment, it, it, we if this were the law of the jungle— he just got caught by the alligator. Well, what are you doing with I that I was moment? the hippopotamus that made it across with that the river. Moment? Are you going to make him do push-ups? Are you going to request it? No, I, but— what, what is that power dynamic doing for you? It's, uh, it's, it's just there. It's just in the <laughs> air. And he knows it, and I know it. We okay. both know it. And, and if we were electing a king— I would be elected king of the TSA uh, X-ray line in that moment. He doesn't win. There's no way for him to win an election for king with his fly down. It's really interesting. This goes back to the Roman Empire debate of, like, in every moment, are we thinking about who would be the king of this TSA line? Like, I'm the man. This is my tribe. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? How often are we looking around being like, oh, I'm in the Delta Lounge. You know what? I think I'd be the top dog here. You know? I mean, that's, <laughs> that is the type of thing sometimes we think about back to the Roman Empire. All right, that's story number one with Pete Hegseth. Story number two. There are, there's speculation out there, Hegseth, that things are on the rocks with Senator John Fetterman and his wife, Giselle. I do not know if that's true. I don't know that it's important whether or not it's true. It seems to be. It's, it's important in that I think it does lead us to a deeper conversation. First, within the news cycle, there's something going on with Senator John Fetterman that is fascinating. He seems to have had an evolution, a conversion, or a seeing of the light. Or he played a huge rope-a-dope on progressives in his run for the Senate. He has changed from embracing freedom on Zen, the, the pushback on regulation of Zen in New York, from Israel to the southern border. Something has changed with Fetterman. I joked on Off the Wall that he went in for mental health issues and came out a Republican. Now, he's not a Republican, but, you know, um, something is going on with Fetterman. Big time. Uh, I don't I don't think is it a is it a gross political calculation in a state that's 50 50? I don't think so. Like, I think you're right with what you said on off the wall. The guy you you you, you you're you're the black is coming in and you're going toward the light and you realize oh, I've only got one shot in this world. I'm going to be honest with how I really feel. I think the dynamic with his wife is a really interesting one. We don't know for sure. By the way, she deleted her social media accounts and everyone was speculating that's because she was getting so much backlash for the positions that her husband was now taking, especially on Israel. 
and she's been a proud progressive for a long time. I don't think you can underestimate or under um, factor in the extent to which change in political positions can change the dynamic of a relationship for a political couple. When, when clearly she's as ambitious as he is, if you staked your whole claim on the popularity of being a virtue singly, uh, signaling progressive, and then the guy who everyone kind of wrote off as a, as a toady of you know every left-wing talking point decides to get an independent mind and talk like Republicans, like that becomes a badge of shame on the, the wife. And again, we don't, from, from her view, and again, we don't know that's exactly what's happening, but if you're used to the fawning glow of the wife of a progressive senator, and now you're indicted because of his positions, and everyone thought he was kind of a dunce anyway, and now you have to defend those or at least live with them, that could be a, a eventual deal breaker. So I I do think we uh, Rachel talks about this all the time. P politicians are couples, and how your couple, how your wife or husband feels about the positions you take, impacts you a lot. And that might clearly he's decided to speak independently. The question is, is she okay with it? Which makes it even more fascinating the relationship dynamic between, for example, James Carville and Mary Matlin, although that dates back to sort of the 90s and the early 2000s, the, the idea that a marriage can survive a Republican and a Democrat, somebody on the left and somebody on the right, um, or Kellyanne Conway and George Conway. Uh, you know, it's, it's what an awkward position to professionally and ideologically be so opposed and then go home and have a harmonious marriage. And I, I'm, I appreciate that you... You reiterated what I've tried to reiterate. We don't know what's happening on between Giselle and Senator Fetterman. We don't know. But what I find fascinating about it is this deeper conversation. And you and I have talked about this. I don't know that we have ever yet talked about it on the air, but I wanted to share two fascinating pieces of research that I came across. One, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson uh, reposted this in Canada they, there's, a, there's a Canadian polling outfit that said, what would it look like if only, from Main Street polling, if only men voted? And it's overwhelming that Canada would be electing a conservative government. Um, it's not a close. It's like a five-to-one proposition of how many men would vote conservative versus how many men would vote liberal. And then there's another... Um, a research outfit. This is uh, Daniel Cox, Survey Center of American Life, combined with Gallup Poll of Social Scientists and the Financial Times analysis, um, showing a divide between men and women, Pete. And uh, I don't have the graph to put up here on the Will Cain Show, but it, it's, it's suffice to say it, it shows a divide between the sexes that is going in opposite directions at the rate of a hockey stick. And it's global. It's not just American. It's in Germany. It's in the UK. It's really stark in South Korea. And it all starts about roughly 2012 to 2015, where men become more conservative and women become more liberal. And we've seen that kind of thing when we say, what would the different states look like or how would America vote if only men voted or only women voted? And I don't know that there's enough talk about the political polarization of men and women. Oh, you're right. I mean, there it's been it's been part of what's been discussed for a long time in that Democrats got a larger portion of the, the female vote and Republicans a larger portion. But why that demarcation? That's what's interesting. I, I'm not here to plug a book, but we thought about this in Battle for the American Mind. And there is there is a, there is something about the um, generational change in the ethos of let's just take America, for example, which was a Western Christian paideia that turned into kind of an American progressive paideia, which was still sort of traditional and patriotic. And then around the turn of the century, effectively, our institutions have embraced what's what we call a culturally Marxist paideia, which cultural Marxism exists to break down um, the traditional roles in society, right? So as as the as the power structures tell men that the things you do well, you should stop doing or do less of, and then tell women, well, you should do more. I mean, we've been doing this for decades, but it becomes more culturally sort of forced. People re reject, I think our human instincts reject that, uh, especially amongst young people who see that and say, I don't want that. And I think that's part of where you see that split. Um, it, it's, it's encouraging, one, amongst men that they recognize we have a role that we 
should and ought want to play inside our own family, inside our communities, inside our churches, inside all of those things are good, but then they, they don't have an outlet for it necessarily. And if they're, if they embrace it, they're told their, uh, their, their masculinity is toxic. And then on the female side, this is, this is for black and white, but I think as you remove, if you have more broken families, as you remove male figures from families, women oftentimes, uh, are, especially in the 60s and 70s with the burst of welfare programs, end up turning to the government to be that male role and, and get some of that support. Uh, and there's a reflection to say, hey, government will help me through my life. And then you've got the basic aspect of just a lot of the left wing arguments are emotionally based. And I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative sense about women. Women are just different than men and men think differently and act differently than women do. And as a result, are more appealing in this sort of idea that we can solve our problems through a piece of legislation. Um, so, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of reasons for it, and I've got plenty of, uh, of uh, additional uh, theories, but it doesn't surprise me. I just don't know where it leads. I mean, you, you, want it, you want to destroy the patriarchy, which is what they say through cultural Marxism, and then you get men that are, are rudderless and women that are looking for real men or looking for the government to solve their problems. No, I think you're on to it. And so so two two additions to these theories that that I would have to help explain it. So first of all is the is the politics of the aggrieved. So um, and it's 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 rooted in some truth. So, I mean, there is no doubt that, you know, it, were we to examine 18th century American history or 19th century American history, it would be driven by the white male figure and the the black minority um would have legitimate grievances and vote towards the party that they presume is going to lift them up into equality. And the same would extend for women, women's suffrage and original feminism and the right to vote. So they would have vestiges. That that takes a long time to separate yourself from, I am in an, an identity group that is an aggrieved minority, and this political party holds itself out as the champion of that agreement. Except Republicans minority. were the political that would party that championed both of those things originally, which is funny. I know. But we, <laughs> we know, but somehow history got turned on its head. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. starting in the 19, what, basically in the 1950s and 60s, those two ideologies in the political parties did switch but on, on, on those issues. But then the other one is, I think you're right. So, and I don't mean it pejoratively either. Look, men and women are complementary figures, and women see the world through more so, I'm not to suggest primarily, but certainly more so than men, through the prism of empathy. And empathy is a necessary tool. But so is what men bring to the table of cold, hard rationality or practicality. Will that achieve what your empathy try to put, pushes you towards? And I think so much of democratic politics plays exclusively on empathy because practicality would show, hey, did the war on poverty solve poverty or did capitalism solve poverty or has all of this grievance politics done that much to actually achieve equality for black Americans? And, but the, 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 the I think the female analysis or perspective of that is caught up again, not pejoratively, but, but it's centered on the idea of empathy, which we need. I think we need individually. I think we need familial. And I think we do need societally as well, but it has to be balanced against that more male instinct of, of cold practicality. Well, and and principle. Play and by that, the way, right? empathy, and can't, and that, that empathy is... can't drive you away from principle. What can't? Empathy cannot drive you away from principle. That's the other thing I'm leaving out. It's not just practicality because it's not just a utilitarian view of the world. But, hey, these are truths we hold self-evident, and here are principles. And empathy can't separate you from those first principles. No, but when you have an education system that's not teaching those first principles uh, and is awash in sort of social justice and this idea that, you know, it, the vehicle through which we do good in this world is through either our own personal activism or the bills that we can get passed and the people that we vote for, uh, then then that then devoid of the underlying principles, uh, that empathy looks really effective. And I think that's why you see that that split and men. um It'll be the interesting part of those hockey stick graphs or what does that look like in in 15, 20 years and and what kind of political movements uh, are created by that? And you get I mean, they always sort of traditionally remember they, the Democrat Party's been known as the mommy party and the the the, the uh, Republican Party known as the daddy party. I mean, there's a reason why those labels for decades have been applied 
is that going to get even hyper more stark, especially with abortion? Uh, I think the Democrats are counting on it, and they're going to keep driving that wedge. Oh, yeah, abortion. But what's interesting, I, what I want to dive into is um, we see everything through the lens of America. What's happening in South Korea? Like, this is happening across the globe. I would like to know what's happening Tell in, me. in South Korea. Tell me. I don't Korea. know. All right, story— Story number uh, three with Pete Hegseth. So last week, Pete jumped on, or two weeks ago, on this regular appearance here, Pete jumped on the Will Cain show and basically called me out for my inconsistencies and my failures when it comes to my New Year's resolutions. So now it's time for me to turn the tables on Pete's all-talk inconsistencies. Uh, There was a weekend where we were talking about some of our deeper or more esoteric approaches to things, and I think we were talking about primarily politics, but also mixed up in this with sports. And, and Pete said, I spent most of my life instinctually rooting for the underdog, you know, whether or not that's in sports or in politics. And I think it was with you were you were referencing Donald Trump. You realized that's not a valuable instinct like or it's not a guiding principle. I shouldn't always just root for the underdog. And by the way, Pete, I have that same underdog like mentality. I don't like rooting for the favorite. It's just not fun, maybe because there's no big payoff with the underdog. I get a big up- upset even if I have a lower percentage of the payoff. It's like the home run hit in fandom. But you talk a big game about rooting for the favorites, and then you prance around in a Detroit Lions hat this weekend, which you're, by the way, you're a sports (laughs) bigamist. You you cheat on your Minnesota Vikings every time I turn around. You're you're not monogamous in your fandom. But you're also not faithful so to true. your. I'm now. I now like. The, I like. I now like the favorites. Count me among the New York Yankee fans. <laughs> wow. Where do I take? Where do I start with that cultural uh, assassination or uh, character assassination that just came? Uh, yeah. We had this conversation in the context of. I'm super passionate about politics because of the implications of how it will impact my future and the future of my kids and my country. But I'm passively passionate about sports and willing to be more frivolous about it because it doesn't matter at all. And I sort of impugned you and said you're a, you you actually self indicted yourself by saying, okay, so you're saying I'm a kid who's never grown up because I'm still passionate about sports <laughs> and games that don't matter. And I would never say such a thing. You said that, uh, but my de- you're right on. I mean, rem- a couple of different conversations happened at once. Yes, Donald Trump rattled my cages on a lot of levels, and one of them was that idea that, like, well, why do we root for losers over and over again when we could be for the winners and 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 we should win? And winning is 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 a vert. And I remember just thinking, yeah, everything I've ever I love underdog candidates, I love underdog stories, I love underdog people, I, and that's me growing up in a blue collar, you know, middle class. My dad would be like, yeah, we're playing the country club kids today. They get their fancy uniforms. They think they're just going to – and we show up in our T-shirts and you beat the pants off them and, and they're going to go home and cry to the, you know, in their rich mansions. You know, like that was sort of the mindset that I grew up with, which I like having that, but I don't like losing time and time again. So I guess I've kind of – in sports, <laughs> I still like the underdog and I'm happy and often root for the underdog. I'm not cheering for the Chiefs. I'm not cheering for the Niners. I'm not – you know, I'm pulling for the Lions. I haven't been there for 35 years. So, yeah, I bought one hat with my kids to give them a little love, and now I'm a sports, you know, whore. I, I, I get that, <laughs> from that, perspe- that perspective. But I would never put on, you know, a, a Democrat hat and be like, yo, I'm kind of, you know. So that's, I guess, where I'm I am mixing it up, up today. With, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to mix it up today with this Kamala hat. <laughs> Just going to mix it up with Kamala a little bit. You know, Rachel will run, jump out and say, oh, I'm kind of like RFK and all that. You know, she's probably more guilty of, of I, she would never accept that. But no, I mean, I guess I also, what am I going to do? Switch to the Yankees because they win a lot? I think there's also something really, you know, sad about people that just affix their themselves to, to winners because they want to be winners. Like Donald Trump grew up in New York and he picked the Yankees instead of the Mets because he's a smart guy. But I didn't have any choices in Minnesota. I had the Twins and the Vikings. And so I'm going to ride or die with them. And there turns out they're underdogs. Hey, you mentioned your wife a minute ago when we were talking about the divide between men and women. Um, I think we talked about this recently as well during a commercial break. You know, uh, Eagles offensive lineman Jason Kelsey, brother to Chiefs, tight end Travis Kelsey, last week went viral. He took his shirt off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, jumped around and chugged a beer. And there was a story afterwards that his wife told him, you better not do that. 
Um, and there was a lot of guys afterwards that said, oh, it's real cute when Jason Kelsey does it. But when I did it at Bob's wedding, nobody <laughs> thought it was funny. <laughs> um, the, the, the question True. I have for you is this. Do you get in trouble? Like there's this conversation about getting in trouble with your wife. I don't get in trouble. Like I, I, I don't. Now, my wife will say things to me like, you know, that's a bad idea. And I value her judgment. Like, but I don't always I don't always do what she says. She tells me not to wear what I'm wearing right now. Like I'm wearing a sweater with a crew neck. And she said men should have a collar on underneath the, the sweater. And I, and I disagree. Right. So I put on my Zelensky sweater. My army She's green right. Zelensky sweater. Uh, so uh, I, I, I valued her judgment. I put it in, and I said, you know what? No, this is what I do. So I don't get in trouble. I don't think I really get in trouble either. Now, full disclosure, Will, my wife is three feet away from me right now. She's sitting right here <laughs> at a desk. So what I so say might have some consequences here. I no, I don't. Like, I'll seek her advice and input. And as I shared with you, I've been no. I have taken my shirt off at an NFL football game and waved my uh, shirt around my head. <laughs> and at NASCAR. Uh, NASCAR, it's a lot more acceptable than uh, the NFL. <laughs> but definitely at NASCAR, had all the kids doing it. But I've done it at an NFL game, too. And I think she would look at me and be like, what are you doing? But I wouldn't get in trouble for it. I mean, the list of things that I would get in trouble for is really high and it would be has a really high bar and would be really bad that any man would get in trouble for other than that no i just get i get a scolding you know or a come on don't you know better and she's a good recoverer she doesn't silent treatment me for two days which is a good attribute right of of a, of a mature woman so i i'm not uh i'm getting a smirk i'm not i'm not too worried about getting in trouble not now. As you she, know, she also pointed out. She also surprising. pointed out my argument was incomplete on the last topic. It's not that you have to cheer for the Yankees. It's that you have to not hate them for being good. And I hated the teams that were good, and that's a bad instinct. So, first of all, least ex, least um, surprising breaking news of this episode here of the Wilkins Show. If you had to vote on one Fox News host that you were pretty sure took his shirt off at a sporting event, it would be you. I, I mean. I said it to you. Get after. We were sitting Get on set. It. We were sitting on set, and I said, have you ever – and we were talking about Kelsey, and then I kind of – it just popped into my head. And I looked over at you, and I said, have you ever taken your shirt off at a game? And you kind of bowed your head for half a second, but then go, yes. And I thought, of course, of course you have. You, All you, in, you're baby. not afraid All of the – 100%. Let's go. Let's do this. I wear jerseys. I, you're not I afraid of really double lettering. my face, but I would. When I – when I knew that, I, the reason I knew that would be you is there's also there's a rule that I was taught when I was younger that you don't double letter. So what that means is you don't wear the jersey and the hat. You wear the hat or the jersey. You don't go Vikings hat, Vikings jersey, but you not only go Vikings hat, Vikings jersey, you go Vikings colored Jordans and a Vikings wristband. So you Correct. you're just short of putting on shoulder pads. <laughs> I'm just short of the guy with the face paint and the shoulder pans and the horns. Yeah, that could be. That's me if I took sports as seriously as I took politics. But my, yeah, I'd like to be a cartoon of a fan. I can't lie. I'm ready to, if they needed to put me in the game, I'd be ready. <laughs> Uh, real quick to, to button it up on guys getting in trouble. I do think, and I'm, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but I'm also a little bit like cultural analysis. I do think that there is a thing where men, for whatever reason, and I don't know to what extent, go about seeking their spouse, their significant other, in the vein of replacing their mom with their wife. I do think it's not just on the wife that says, hey— you're in trouble. I think there's a little bit of glutton for punishment from the man that puts himself in a relationship where he gets in trouble. It's I do think he's replacing his mom with his wife. <laughs> I think that could be true, and uh, you learn the hard way. You figure it out. And uh, thankfully, you know, here's what I've learned, Will. Have you ever, do you ever call your wife mom? Like, do you ever say to no. the kids, hey, mom? No, no. Like, listen to mom or do what mom says. Oh, yeah. But, You're I, mom. but I'm, I, I'm I saying think, I'm yeah. starting to blur that line a little bit every once in a while. Sometimes I say mom in a context where I, I should be referring to as my wife or Jen. And I say mom and the kids are around and I don't like that. And I got I got to reel that back in because you see couples that have been together for 25 years and it's mom only. And that's not good. No, you got to button that up. 
you got to fix that real quick. You can't call her mom, except if it's your mom or, hey, guys, go. Your mom said this. If it's just the two of you and the kids aren't in the house and you're like, hey, mom, (laughs) we need another episode of this to break down what's going on. We're not there yet, but I don't want to get there. (laughs) All right. Story number four with Pete Hegseth. Um, Mark Cuban has just been in it. The, The front of basketball operations for the Dallas Mavericks, the former owner of the Dallas Mavericks. He's just been in it when it comes to DEI. And he's got into this massive debate with an anonymous account on X uh, entitled The Rabbit Hole. And they've just gone back and forth. And, and look, I don't, there's a level of fandom to me when it comes to the Dallas Mavericks, although I'm starting to be like, I'm not sure Mark is really good at running the Mavericks, where I root for Mark Cuban. But this whole DEI thing has been a thing where I'm like, what's wrong with Mark Cuban? And he's openly advocating for racial preferences or racial the use of race in in hiring and he said the following to 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 in his ongoing debates with rabbit hole he posted um let's turn this around you're a ceo of a successful company that has 30 employees that are all black women and you think a different perspective will help you grow the firm so you decide you want to hire a white man would you be against that He thinks he's turning it on its head and showing the value of hiring someone of a different race or different background. He thinks he's turning it on its head to say, this is why you would do so. If it were 30 white men, you'd look to hire a black woman. Mike Solano, who is a commentator on X, said this in response. The way this man just casually argued a room of 30 black women constitutes the presence of a single opinion and thinks that not is not racist is wild. So what he's pointing out is Mark presumes in his like, I'm going to be really cute rhetorically and logically here and reverse engineer this. But he undercuts the idea and exposes it. He's presuming 30 black women all have the same opinion. Exactly. That to me is the the underlying um, assumption that where this entire argument is racist and fails is that an entire racial group or gender group or the combination of the two is a monolith with one mind. And this is how they think. And this is what they do based on what caricature. Based on your lens of what a black woman would think or how she would operate or what her value system would be, what black woman, a black woman from Atlanta or from Minnesota or from uh, or, or a rich black woman or a, or a poor black woman? I mean, same, same of any gender or race. The whole thing assumes a sort of a herd mentality. And every argument that he makes is, is premised on that. So, yeah, if we have 30 black women, then we need to bring a white man on for a different perspective. You're, you're, you're just assuming one thing about all those women. And yeah, the other thing is, why is Mark Cuban debating an anonymous account? I, I don't understand. This is what I don't <laughs> understand about the Internet. I, 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 I wish I didn't have the Internet. I wish I didn't have social media. I wish I you know, only wrote letters. But I wouldn't write any, so I wouldn't talk to anybody. <laughs> okay? I, I don't want any of this, but I'd like to put the whole genie back in the bottle, but I can't. But even, even – okay, so we have it. But why are like billionaires debating anonymous accounts called rabbit hole? The whole point is to take you down a rabbit hole. But apparently he thinks he can prove something. And in the process – I mean I love – the environment that Musk has created where people can challenge these 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 billionaires and expose them for their assumptions, which are really elementary. And if they have to defend them, they can't. And there be people have made, you know, targeted, well, why don't you have certain people on your basketball team if it's if you believe in different different racial and gender backgrounds? He's just he's just well, hasn't thought it through and wants to be liked by the right people. And so he says dumb stuff. I actually think it's more complicated. I have a little bit of a pushback. So on, on okay. its surface, I am I am right there. And, and I have spent countless hours in media, both in sports media and now in political media, talking about how offensive it is to presume someone's individual thoughts are predetermined or, or presumed based upon their superficial characteristics. Yeah. And I think that's true, and especially when it's used as an enforcement mechanism. You know, you're black, so you have to vote this way or think this way. Like, the most offensive thing is, like, what was said by Joe Biden. If you don't vote for me, you're not black. That's out of sight racist. But, um, and, I, and, I, and I, I find people who, you know, blaze trails of individuality fascinating. I find Thomas Sowell fascinating. But, you know, Pete, that also acknowledges that he is blazing an independent trail. So there is a reality that we have to acknowledge that I think maybe Mark Cuban is baked in there. 
And that is there are demographic correlations to points of view. I mean, that's just a statistical fact. You know, 90 percent of people do black people do vote black. I mean, uh, do vote Democrat. And, you know, was we just got done talking about men are increasingly voting Republican and women are increasingly voting Democrat. And so I, I don't know, like, did Mark Cuban get caught in this racist moment? Or is he resting this on something that we all know is there and we all talk about? And it doesn't rob anyone of their individuality, and it shouldn't rob you of your individuality, but it also can't have you pretending that the world doesn't exist the way that it does exist. Then I guess wouldn't that all depend on what kind of company you run and what kind of outcome you want and how and, and the type of profile of person you're looking for? So, you know, I that it exposes the 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 um the desires of like airlines to say, okay, we want um you know, certain types of female or minority pilots. Well, if you don't have a problem with your takeoff and landing rate with the current pilots you have, then what are you trying to get after other than some quota or number that may allows you to virtue signal? But if you're running a company that's trying to, I don't know, market to, to different types of people with different viewpoints, then there might be some um, value yeah. in identifying certain traits and different backgrounds. But that, again, that's a bottom line calculation, not a skin color calculation per se. That's why I'm, I'm so uh, uh, against what the military is doing. It's like, okay, you don't need, if you, if you need a good rifleman, it doesn't matter if they were rich or poor or black or white, the skills you can teach them uh, are, are, are going to manifest the same if you train them properly. So I, I see what you're saying. I don't know. I mean, I guess. The, yeah. But the, again, I well, want what it I'm driven saying, by the bottom I think, line. And I want it driven. So I guess in the end, like I've always I'll also push back and the left says this and I agree with the left on this. Like the presumption of colorblindness is ridiculous. Like no one walks through the world truly colorblind. We all see each other's differences. And we and so in the corollary to this thing with Mark Cuban, we can all acknowledge reality. We can see, oh, certain demographic uh, groups have a common point of view or a more common point of view or vote a certain way. But then after acknowledging reality, we strive to get beyond that and see each other and give each other the opportunity as individuals, you know? And so it's not colorblindness. It's, it's, um, it's, looking beyond color to what you're talking about, merit and character Well, it's and very nice of you to give, like you put on the Kamala Harris there hat for a second. There's very nice of you to give a, a little bit of a, a nod to the left. Um, I will give yeah. no quarter. Yeah. Okay. Colorblindness <laughs> should be, I'm just kidding. Uh, c colorblindness should be our goal. That's what I was taught. I know it's not possible. I know it's not, um, you know, you're just going to see someone's, but that, I don't know. I just I, I hate the fact that this movement has written that off as somehow racist or unacceptable when to me that was always the goal um, is to move past this superficial labeling. And I'd For like sure. to recapture that, actually. Colorblind is like, that's how I, I think we're saying the same thing. The probably just I think we're seeing saying the same thing. It's it's a it's, totally it's um, like so many things. It's caught up in semantics. People use different words. Story number five with Pete Hegg said, finally, Pete and I every weekend have. Pretty well, we do. We have breakfast together every weekend, yes. sometimes on set, sometimes in the American Express Lounge, sometimes it's Chick fil A bowl for breakfast, sometimes it's a uh, sausage, egg, and cheese. We're both, by the way, trying to get better. We both have made a vow last weekend at the American Express Lounge to stop eating so much French toast that our faces begin to look like zits that need to be popped. So we need to. Pete was the one that said maybe no carb February, but you yeah. also have told me you, you're big into cereal. Your, your family is a big cereal family. You grew up a big cereal guy. And so, by the way, not really, definitely not now. I don't even think we stock cereal. Um, I don't like drinking milk for breakfast. And, and when I was growing up, like, I had these arbitrary rules in my house where, like, we didn't get sugary cereals, but we got Apple Jacks. Like, Apple Jacks is where we really stretched our legs. But most of the time, it was like Honey Nut Cheerios, which is also sugary. But Lucky Charms and Fruity Pebbles, no way that stuff was making it into my house. Um, so you are much more of an expert on cereals. So I thought maybe today we'd end with, give me your top cereals. I appreciate that. Uh, same rules applied in the South household when I was growing up. No treats. We call it treat cereal. You know, we're not doing that. But then my dad would have Rice Krispies on the daily and pour a mountain of sugar on top of it as if that was better. Uh, than whatever terrible else cereal. It could, by the way, could terrible be in the cereal. Terrible, terrible, terrible. There's no, by the way, I love milk. I'm a, we're a whole milk family only. 
whole milk is unbelievable. I used to call it restaurant milk because we had 1% at home and then we go to the restaurant and drink milk and it would be way better. And I'd be like, why is restaurants milk better? Because it was just whole milk. So cereal has to be had with very cold whole milk. And when you have cereal with very cold whole milk, it's life-changing. It's basically like eating ice cream, even if you're not having sugar cereal. So here's my top five non-treat treat cereal five, top five go. going away crispix is my favorite non-treat i love it i don't know it's half rice it's half corn it's phenomenal special k number two simple terrible amazing. grape nuts soggy fantastic you, you you can't you gotta you gotta kind of fit you gotta eat it fast because you want the crunch and so you put more milk in than the grape nuts you kind of swamp it and then you get every bite yeah. with lots of milk in it with crunchy nuts. I'm still a Wheaties guy because I loved it back when you could get your favorite local sports guy in the cover. Love it. And Cheerios, can, I can still go for Cheerios. A lot of the Holiday and Expresses I stay at, they've got Cheerios. They've got one treat cereal and something else, and I go Cheerios. Now, sweet cereal, right. Lucky Charms, Cocoa Krispies, Fruity Pebbles, Honeycomb, doesn't get enough love, uh, and Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Okay. Here's the failures and here's the successes. S cereals like Fruity Pebbles are in the Rice Krispies vein. They're just vehicles for sogginess. They're terrible because Gotta all you do fast. is just mush, fast. mush things between your teeth. Same criticism of the Special K's and the Wheaties and to a less extent the Frosted Flakes. I don't like the flake-based cereal. It's also a machine for sogginess. Well, you're, you're, you've, you're, you've been doing it wrong. Well, here's where you wrong. did well. I, I, hold on, just real quick, one quick on that. You, you just pour smaller bowls. This is what I do. I, I pour tiny little bowls, and I put milk in, and I eat it fast, and it stays crunchy the whole time. So don't do big bowls. Do lots of small bowls. And less milk, by the way. I go low milk, if, it, if, if any of these. Okay. By the way, grape nuts is a great call. I think grape nuts is a hugely underrated cereal. And the in on the sweet treats, you're right. It's Lucky Charms. That's, that's, the solid, that's the solid cereal. And by the way, don't give me this only marshmallow. Lucky Charms. You need the treat of the marshmallow in hidden inside the bland other parts of the Lucky Charms to make it fun. If it's all marshmallow, it's not fun. It's like sunny days. I lived in Southern California. You know what's the thing about it? If you got 365 sunny days, you know what they stop being? Sunny days. You need some rainy days, some cold days to make you appreciate the sunny day. I need the bland part of the Lucky Charms to appreciate the fun part of the Lucky Charms. And then finally, the, that is the one you didn't analysis. mention. Uh, <laughs> the 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 one you didn't mention that I think deserves love is Honey Bunches of Oats. I think it's a awesome combination of flake and crunch and sweet and nutritious. It brings it all together. Honey Bunches of Oats. I just have nothing for oats. I have nothing for granola. Uh, my I my wife eats fistfuls of granola on the regular, and I look at her and I I just oh, I think, are granola. you a squirrel? I just don't I just don't understand <laughs> granola. So that's why it's out for me. I love nuts. I love granola. I love Pete Hegseth. All right, buddy. Always fun. I'll love see you, you on the weekend. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Take care. There he goes. My co-host of Fox and Friends Weekend and Off the Wall, Pete Hegseth here on The Will Cain Show. Everyone talks about trans athletes being a threat to women's sports. You know what might be the biggest threat to women's sports? The biggest threat to Title IX? It's actually the free market. That's coming up on The Will Cain Show. I'm Dana Perino, and this is Perino on Politics. Dana Perino, co-host of The Five and co-anchor of America's Newsroom, returns to Fox News Audio with a brand new podcast, Perino on Politics. Listeners of Everything Will Be Okay will be thrilled by the return of a familiar voice, but with a fresh spin as Dana guides audiences through the 2024 election cycle. Make sure you subscribe to this series wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. Fox weather. We are definitely in the beginning of blizzard conditions. Weathering it together. From bone chilling cold to sketchy snow. With Winter Storm HQ. The winds have whipped. When winter storms strike. This Arctic blast now threatening the Northeast. There's only one team you can count on. We're expecting multiple days of snow. When it's cold outside. Big snow developing across the four corners. Fox weather turns up the heat. What a storm. Fox weather is Winter Storm HQ. 
new from the Fox News Podcast Network. I'm Emily Campagno, and this is the Fox True Crime Podcast. And I had nothing to do with her disappearance. I sit down with the people who lived the nightmares. I was in shock. I was just devastated. The investigators who tirelessly worked on the case. And I really hope that they can catch this guy. Bringing you closer to the story than you ever thought possible. Listen and follow now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. These are the stories that keep you up at night. Everyone talks about trans athletes being a threat to women's sports, but the real threat to Title IX is the free market. That's coming up in just a moment here on the Will Kane Show, streaming live at foxnews.com and on the Fox News YouTube channel. But what should be done about Congressman Ilan Omar, who basically and openly said that her priorities are Somalia first. Let's get into that, plus a few other issues, with Congressman Chip Roy of Texas, who joins us now. Fellow Texan Chip Roy, great to have you on the show here, Congressman. Yeah, great to be on the show. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we, as we've talked about before, I was a prosecutor in Sherman, your hometown. I used to drive up and down 75 from McKinney up to the, uh, you know which building it is, because it's the only building that, that, you know, has those kind of offices in it. And, uh, and then I also worked out of the Plano Courthouse. But anyway, back and forth. Yeah, man, I, I, I grew up going to that federal courthouse in Sherman watching my dad argue in front of Judge Paul Brown. So I love our common connections. Uh, Congressman, hey, I wanted to ask, and I told your staff, when okay, when, when the congressman comes in today, I want to talk to him about a couple of different issues. But, you know, listen, um, I do. I think that you are a thinker, and I think that you are someone who is who is focused with good intentions on what is the best for, I hope, your, obviously your district for the state of Texas, but also the United States of America. And we do a lot when we come on Fox and talking points get repetitive and subjects even get repetitive. And I thought, you know what? I just want to ask the congressman, what is the, in your estimation the biggest issue facing America that very few people are talking about that's not making its way, for example, onto Fox? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there's probably a lot, but I'm just going to you know, usually go with your gut. I'm going to give my first answer. Uh, my pastor from the um, uh, church that I was in for about 20-something years in, in Austin, High Park Baptist Church, recently put out a post detailing the extent to which the um, what's called nuns, right, the people who have no, no affiliation with church, is on the rise. So if you go back to two, I mean, these numbers are going to be rough, but from my head, 2007, I think we were at about 16% of Americans who checked the box saying no affiliation, right, in terms of their, their uh, affiliation with any church, Protestant, Catholic, anything. And now that number is about 28%. That's been about 15 years. We've gone from 16% to 28%. That is stark uh, shift has occurred for people under the age of 50. 70% of those nuns are under 50. Uh, and the uh, target there really is it's also heavily males and frankly, uh, white population. So we've got a real problem <laughs> where we are losing uh, our younger men, men in particular and our younger generation generally, um, you know, that's always been an issue, right? You've got young people and they're exploring and you know, but they kind of had a foundation and they come back to the church and you go through life. We got a real problem now. So if you ask me if there's something, it's a cultural issue, right? And, and we start losing our soul as a nation in terms of what our founding principles were built upon. When we move away from those principles of Western civilization, it, go, it goes to the heart of the fight in Israel right now. It goes to the heart of the fight right now about our border. It goes to the heart of the fight right now in terms of our, uh, woke policies and, you know, that a man can have a baby and all that kind of stuff. It's all being turned on its head. So I, if that answers your question, I'd say that's that, that's concerning to me. Well, here's what I appreciate what, what you had to say. Anybody that le- believes in freedom and the concept of limited government also has to acknowledge that society and culture has to rest upon something else that guides morality. Yeah. If you don't turn to the government to define, hey, what's the way to live a good life, you have to have some guiding light, some principle. And it's just a matter of uh, historical fact that in America that was a Christian-based value system that guided people. And if you are cast adrift and, and you don't have some affiliation, you're going to seek something. You're going to seek some moral guidance. You're going to seek some purpose. And I do think, to your point, what we're seeing so much with young men, I actually think that, you know, the the proliferation of school shootings, I think that the the, the rising rates of mental health issues all can come back to this foundational uh, erosion of, hey, what is it that gives you meaning? 
No, I agree. Well, you could, you stated it very well. I mean, I would say, you know, what was it that brought America from small walks of life in 1944 to sit in the, in the foxholes in Bastogne together? Whether you were, grew up in Brooklyn or whether you grew up in West Texas or you grew up in Iowa or you grew up in, you know, San Francisco, you came together and we had largely a fabric a thread that held us all together. Belief in our, our country, yes, a patriotism built upon, you know, our belief in shared values, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, what we taught our kids in schools, but also just who we are, who we were. That is getting torn apart, right? People don't realize, and there's a connection here, of uh, 50%, I'm sorry, 50 million people, that is about 16% of Americans are foreign born. Now, that's higher than any level, even going back to the 19th century. But it's concerning now in particular because of what I just said, right? We're breaking away from our foundational principles. We're breaking away from having people churched. And we're not teaching our kids in schools that America is great, that Western civilization is strong, that the Constitution is good, that God exists. We're not teaching any of that stuff. We're teaching the opposite. America is evil. Don't believe in the Constitution. Tear down statues of Thomas Jefferson. You can't talk about God. Uh, men can have babies, right? We are breaking down everything that bound us together. So how on earth can you then unite, right? That's, that's I think, the foundational question for us heading into, you know, the, the future of our country going forward. So then that brings me to this. I want to I want to ask you about your colleague, Congressman Ilan Omar. Uh, she gave a speech. The translations she gave it it wasn't in English. Uh, the translations of which suggest she said something like her interests are Somalia first, and that her role as she sees it inside of Congress is to guide the American government toward um, the interests of Somalia. She also talked about her uh, appreciation for whatever it is, the king or president of of, of Somalia. Um, you know, Congressman. And we can get into this a little bit uh, to the amount of time we have together. Like, you know, I actually, I think on this, Donald Trump and, and Ron DeSantis probably see the country in the same way. And that is, and I say that because I know you supported Ron DeSantis, um, America first, right? A as a modern day, as a modern day, um, n not, not necessarily with all its historical ties is what I'm suggesting, but as a modern day iteration is about like, hey, should we be electing people? You know, I didn't like it when your other colleague, and I would tell him this, Congressman Brian Mast wore an IDF uniform on the floor of the Congress. I don't, I don't like that. I don't want a congresswoman from Minnesota saying it's Somalia first. It seems to me a pretty basic issue. If you're elected, you should represent America first. Yeah, well, first of all, and, and thank you for bringing that up, and I know we're not here to litigate the presidential deal, but I agree with you, actually. I mean, the, the, the President Trump, when he came into office in 2016, and then in his four years in office— espousing America first was absolutely the right thing to do. And it, frankly, it put us in a better footing around the world. He, he was heading us in the right direction with respect to the border. There are a whole lot of positive things to say there, right? I just had my views about someone who could serve for eight years and other things. And, you know, that's been litigated and Governor DeSantis has, has uh, suspended his campaign. But the point matters. We need leaders, not just President Trump as a candidate and, and running this year, not just Governor DeSantis in Florida. We need members of Congress to stand up loudly to advance America first and to check and hold responsible those who are who are doing the opposite. Now, I've got to parse her words and go look at it, right? Whether you censure, like we just recently censured Congresswoman Tlaib for her ridiculous commentary with respect to Israel and, and, and Hamas and, 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 and so forth. So we spoke on the record on that, and that was important. Um, we obviously just removed um, Representative Santos for some you know, legal questions. I did not support that removal because due process matters. And he hadn't gone to court, and Congress shouldn't go through that. Not to go down a rabbit trail, but my point is, I got to go think about what you're asking. What is the right approach to handle uh, Congresswoman Omar's uh, uh, statements? But they are reprehensible, and they are deserving of rebuke. And I've raised that issue with the Speaker and with people in the in the in the conference because it matters that the American people see this. I want I mean, the context of what you're talking about for the listeners who haven't or viewers who haven't seen it. She was standing in a room filled with people, predominantly, it appears, based on the video, to be Somali, uh, pushing that issue of saying, we're going to force them, meaning us, the leaders of this country, to respond to the demands and interests of Somalia. That is a big problem. And that was happening in Minnesota. This is what I was getting at about what's happening with respect to people flooding into our country, 50 million foreign born. We better get you know, some religion really quickly about what we want to do as a country to preserve and protect our own sovereignty 
in terms of borders and our immigration policy and how we handle it. Well, you, I, so I heard you kind of almost workshopping, and I appreciate you said, I got to yeah. think about what the right approach may be, but I could also hear you kind of workshopping and drawing parallels with Santos mm-hmm. and, and Tlaib in terms of censure and kicking out. And, I, and while we're talking about DeSantis, I believe DeSantis, I can't remember specifically what he's called for when it comes to Omar, but I, 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 what did he say? Was yeah. it? I, think, I, I can't he remember. Said, what, I think he what, said she should be removed from Congress, deported, and something else. I can't remember. It was a strong statement. I mean, he, he wasn't equivocal. And I certainly have that same gut reaction. Uh, but I also, I always try to, you know, you got to be measured. It's the former prosecutor in me. I got to go into, okay, what are the facts in front of me? What did she say? What are the standards? What is due process, censure, removal? But we've got to have a serious conversation because it was an absolutely absurd statement by a sitting member of Congress. I appreciate the deliberation you just laid out there on how, um, how, um, like you said, prosecutorial or calculate you need to be in making sure you make the right decision. But the gut instinct, I think it's all of us in the same in the same way. Yep. Hey, while we're on DeSantis for a moment, um, listen, I, I don't know. I don't know. You and I ever talked off camera. We definitely talked on camera about DeSantis. I know you were a big supporter of him. Mm-hmm. Something didn't click with Ron DeSantis. It could just been the presence of Donald Trump. But I don't know. I don't know, Congressman. I I, I don't know. Uh, and I and people that love Ron DeSantis have trouble accepting that I can have both of these thoughts at the same time. Mm-hmm. I can really like him, which I do as a governor, and have some doubts about his ability ability to appeal to the nation at large. And now he's not running again. It's like he's resonating again, like on this or other issues. Something fell short with Ron DeSantis. So, you know, I, I, I like, like I generally speak openly and truthfully, and I will hear I'm, I'm particularly close with him, spent a lot of time with him. And I would try to be mindful of, of private conversations we've had. But in broad terms, I'll just say this. Yes, he's been knocking out of the park since he's suspended. I um, mean, I was in Tallahassee last weekend. You know, the last, what, now almost two weeks, 10 days. He's just been killing it, killing it on social media. He and his son, Mason, talking about football games. You know, just not even batting an eye at these tough considerations. Omar should be booted. Way like, more I mean, personality. Just, to your right, point, way more it. personality but, than as a candidate. So what I've been trying to tell people, I was on the stump, right? I did, what, 50 events or whatever it was across Iowa and, and South Carolina and New Hampshire. That's the, that's the Ron that I know, right? That's the governor who was a great governor. Uh, that's who I see out there. That's the husband, the father, the, the engaging individual. Look, here's the deal. At the end of the day, he was running, to his credit and courage, he was running into the buzzsaw, running into the wind of Donald Trump, who is, you know, a spectacle into him, um, himself, right? So you're running into, no offense to Fox, essentially a 20 to 1 earned media disadvantage against you know, the, the Trump uh, discussions on Fox and every other network, Newsmax and everything else. So that's difficult. Like, just mathematically, you're just you're having to run against that. And you have to make a call. Like, go look at Nikki, right? Nikki is trying to go get Democrats, independents, and the softest side of the Republican Party, right? Nobody can actually debate mm-hmm. that. That's literally what she's doing. Ron DeSantis was running as essentially for a lot of the block that supports Donald Trump. It's tired of the swamp, wants the place to change. So it was hard to make a call, like, how much do you hit Donald Trump? There are things to criticize Donald Trump for, well removed from any of the stuff that's in the news. Like, for example, I made some of the Trump world mad because I called him out on shutdowns, on Fauci, on the vax mandates and and the warp speed. I called him out on not getting the border fully secured and siding with Paul Ryan when they did an amnesty bill in the summer of 2018. I called him out on not getting Obamacare repealed. I know it was John McCain that did this. But you know what? When they came in, he was working with Paul Ryan. Oh, let's do a soft Obamacare light. Look, I could go down a laundry list. I'm not here to bash Trump. I, President Trump is decidedly easy to, to support in terms of his love of America, you know, against Joe Biden. I mean, come on, this is easy stuff. But for me, Ron DeSantis offered somebody who had delivered overwhelmingly in Florida. So I think to answer your question, it was an almost insurmountable challenge to go want to go attract the Trump voter away from Trump to get behind DeSantis. Yeah. 21 percent of Iowa was pretty good. Uh, he just wanted to do better. So, you know. The only one I'd push back on, and, and look, I don't presume anybody is perfect. Um, and no politician right. is beyond criticism. Uh, but vax mandates. I mean, while Fauci and warp speed are things that, that we, we, we could um, analyze and criticize, I mean, I don't, he didn't embrace any vax mandates that I'm aware of. Am I missing something that Trump pushed vax mandates? 
Well, he yeah, first of all, yes. I, I, go, I go back and find some quotes and I'll shoot them to you, you know, by cell. I got to go find them on top of my head. But, but, but importantly, remember he went out and he said to governors, you don't have the power to do this. I do. Remember, he stood up and defended Fauci. Read a lot of quotes where he's standing at the microphone saying, this is important. We got to do this. And importantly, he gave Fauci a freaking commendation on the way out of town. Like, look, he's never apologized for shutting down the biggest economy in the history of the world, pushing these vaccines out and saying, you got to go get these things. Mandates notwithstanding, the federal government started engaging in those mandatory things and, you know, military and everything else. I can't remember the timeline of when that happened versus Joe Biden's tenure, but they had set the stage as that was getting released. And he's never said, hey, that was a bad idea to promote it. I, and I don't want to litigate because I don't have it in front of me either. I think right. the vaccine comes out in like November, December for first the first group of people that can get it. Yeah, it's it then in the spring of 21. And so I would assume a lot of those mandates are under Joe Biden within the federal yeah, government that, that, uh, hierarchy. That's probably. correct. But the, but but I will say, though, the warp speed push and the and the hey, uh, for the lockdowns, I have the power. You don't have the power as governors. And and frankly, never wanting to say you know, back away from all of that, I think that's a problem. But anyway, he went and litigated. The point is, three years of President Trump were awesome and strong economy and standing up alongside Israel and standing up for our border and standing up for our men and women in uniform. I mean, that, those are all obvious and easy things to yeah. praise. Let's end it with this, um, because I know you have a heart out here at the top of the hour. So what is your relationship? I know that he, when you were supporting Ron DeSantis, Trump said, hey, uh, let's primary Chip Roy. Um, you know, I hear you now. I, it sounds to me like now there's like I don't know. Do you support you support Trump now versus Nikki? What is your relationship with Trump? Well, honestly, we don't really have a direct one on one relationship. We didn't when he was president. I, mean, I went over the White House a few times. We met in group formats and stuff. Like bottom line is, uh, I'm going to support the Republican nominee. Period. I've said that Nick, uh, Nikki Haley is not uh, who should be the nominee. Um, you know, we're we're you know I appreciate the president, but by the way, when the RNC was playing with the games with oh just go ahead and anoint and. He put out a statement that said, no, I need to do this the old-fashioned way. That is correct. Go earn it state by state. Go through Nevada, go through South Carolina, and so forth. Um, but importantly, remember, this is funny. I worked for Rick Perry. You'll appreciate this as a Texan. Remember Rick Perry called him, I think, uh, a cancer uh, in the summer of 2015, maybe? Or maybe 16. I can't remember which. And then he ended up being his secretary of energy. Right? right? Look, politics is a rough and tumble sport. And, and look, President Trump knows that, appreciates that. Uh, I work very closely with a lot of people in his administration. Russ Vogt, the head of the Office of Management and Budget, is one of my best friends. Uh, Tom Homan, former head of ICE. Mark Morgan, former head of Border Patrol. I can go down a list. These are all my dear friends. We're all on the same team of what we're trying to do. I think primaries are important. Uh, President Trump is, you know, he's not going to hold grudges on that. Some of the influencers out there are a little bit, uh, shall I say, not exactly how you should handle yourselves. But I'll be fine with President Trump going forward. Well, to, to me, as I've looked from distance, I, I don't see a lot of daylight ideologically between you and all these others, you know, that right. we're talking about. And so, um, listen, I, I appreciate you coming on. I always appreciate our conversations. I hope to have you more here in the future on The Will Cain Show. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, uh, you know, get a beer in Texas or D.C. or New York or wherever. But uh, good to see you. Sounds good. Take care, Congressman Chip Roy. There you go. Fascinating conversation. I think also a way to see some of these guys outside of the normal confines of a three-minute television hit, what they think and how they think. Coming up, the biggest threat to women's sports might not be trans athletes, but it might just be the free market. That's next on The Will Cain Show. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. Hey there, it's me, Kennedy. Make sure to check out my podcast, Kennedy Saves the World. It is five days a week, every week. We check in with Jimmy Fela, bring in authors for The Book Club, and even treat some of your favorite Fox personalities to a very special happy hour. Download and listen at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Kennedy Saves the World. America's listening to Fox News. Your favorite Fox News funny man, Jimmy Fallon, has a new book, The Cancel Culture Dictionary. How have we not gotten a game show spinoff called Wheel of Cancel? No, it's not an actual dictionary. It's an A to Z guide to winning the war on fun. The fact that we're defunding the joke police is a win for America. With a collection of cancellations by the outrage mob, Jimmy Fallon's Cancel Culture Dictionary. Yo, what is going on in this country right now? Order your copy of The Cancel Culture Dictionary now at foxnewsbooks.com. 
Get all of your favorite Fox News podcasts ad-free on Apple Podcasts with Fox News Podcasts Plus. From Trey Gowdy, the Fox News Rundown, Will Kane, Brian Kilmeade, and so much more. Go to foxnewspodcasts.com for all the details. The Fox News Rundown, a contrast of perspectives you won't hear anywhere else. Your daily dose of news twice a day. Featuring insight from top newsmakers, reporters, and Fox News contributors. Listen and subscribe now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. NCAA scholarship limits. Did you know there are four and a half scholarships for men's volleyball and 12 scholarships for women's volleyball? It is the Will Kane Show streaming live at foxnews.com and at the Fox News YouTube channel. On video, on demand, our interviews like that with Pete Hegseth, yesterday with Dave Portnoy, last week with Jordan Peterson or Stephen A. Smith or The Rock, all available, Will Kane Show on YouTube. You can also listen to this podcast whenever you'd like on demand, Apple, Spotify, or at Fox News Podcasts. Go hit subscribe. You can't defeat the free market. A few years ago, I was appearing on ESPN's first take, and I was explaining the pay difference between women's U.S. national team soccer players and men's national team soccer players. The conversation is painted in the public square as though it's a reflection of the gender pay gap, that it's misogyny, that it is bigotry that results in Megan Rapino making less money than Christian Pulisic. When the truth is, it's simple arithmetic. It's simple math. The men's World Cup is exponentially larger than the women's World Cup. It's divorced from the performance of the men's national team or the women's national team. The bottom line is it's an entertainment product. And if more people watch you lose, then you will make more money than a smaller group of people that come in to watch you win. It's simple free market. That clip went viral about a year ago on TikTok and Instagram, weirdly three years or so after I made that argument. But we're watching that same argument play out when it comes to the NCAA. Title IX is the, is the federal law that brought gender equity to college sports. It meant that the same number of scholarships would be available for men and women when it comes to sports, when it comes to the NCAA. It's really fascinating. I remember when it came in, and all of a sudden what you begin to see is some non-revenue-generating sports on the men's side disappear. UCLA, a famous, very good men's swimming program overnight, axed. You saw men's programs axed to the point today there are, I believe I have the numbers correct, 23 women's NCAA scholarship providing sports. There's 17 men's sports. If you want, if you have a daughter and you're looking for a scholarship, there's some sports out there that just aren't available to your son, like five scholarships available for archery, uh, six if you're into badminton. 10 if your daughter plays handball. How about this? Squash, 12 women's scholarships. There's zero on any of these sports when it comes to men. Another 12 for field hockey. If your daughter's into bowling, she can get a college scholarship. If your son's into bowling, good luck. Maybe there's a tour he can join. But it also broke down according to how many different sports got a men's scholarship versus a women's scholarship. And I find these numbers fascinating. For example, my sport, I always knew when we were there, you you get four and a half scholarships in water polo. But on the women's side, they have eight scholarships they can use to build a team. Gymnastics, men's six and a half scholarships. Women's, 12. Basketball's 13 and 15, a little bit closer. Track, men's track and field athletes, 12. Women's, 20. Soccer, 9.9 for men, 14 for women. And volleyball, from what I can see, is the biggest disparity. Men's volleyball has four and a half scholarships. Women's volleyball has 12 scholarships. Now, why? Why is this? Because everybody's trying to balance out against football. 85 scholarships for football, and that eats up so much of the men's quota that you get sports for women, more sports for women, and you get more scholarships for sports where you have both a men's and a women's program. And that was the idea. That was how you would increase increase opportunity. That's how you would create the, I guess, I guess somehow attainable goal of gender equity. But 
there's been a lot of talk about trans athletes like Leah Thomas upending that apple cart. First of all, swimming on the women's swimming team at Penn, or now Leah is petitioning to be able to go to the Olympics as a women's swimmer. Just, I mean, societal insanity. But what really might be a threat is the demise of the currency that is the college scholarship. I heard this story recently, very high up at um, a big Division I university. This university was telling me they were recruiting one a, a high-level collegiate golfer, and they offered him a scholarship. But he went to another program, a bigger program, where they didn't have any available scholarships. Now, why would he go to a school where he is offered no scholarship versus a school where he's being offered a full scholarship? Because of name, image, and likeness. By going to this other program, he has a back door into paying for his education. He has a back door into getting more than perhaps the value of his education. He can make money. And this is in golf. Now, golf is, while not a big collegiate revenue generating sport, it is a personality driven sport and it can springboard you into, you know, a big professional career. But it's a fascinating decision that shows the declining value of the scholarship. We see this in, in, Division one football as well. We've seen athletes that now, I mean, everybody gets a scholarship mostly at 85 scholarships, but the NIL becomes, the NIL deal becomes more valuable. Because what we're talking about here, look, at the highest levels, it's millions, but that's not really who we're talking about here. We're talking about lower level athletes. It's still six figures. It's easy to get NIL deals in the hundreds of thousands. As compared against, in well, what, a public school scholarship? I mean, in state, by the way, you're talking about what, $20,000? Out of state, you're talking $40,000? So you're talking about the scholarship no longer being the currency of college sports. And if scholarships aren't the currency, how do you enforce gender equity? There's a lawsuit that's just been filed by the states of Tennessee and Virginia um, against the NCAA saying they can't enforce rules that limit NIL. It's a violation of the free market. It's an uh, antitrust violation. So they can't go in, according to this lawsuit, and say, no, you only have this much NIL. You have this much. They, don't, they can't salary cap the NIL. Now, we'll see if they win those lawsuits. But if you have no limitations on what you can offer an athlete NIL, what you're talking about is complete free market and paying athletes. And combined with that exceeding the value of a scholarship, you have no way of normalizing, in terms of the pursuit of gender equity, the goal of Title IX. What is a, you know, oh, men's volleyball, four and a half scholarship, women volleyball, 12 scholarships. What do I need a scholarship for? 12 dudes getting NIL money, you know, at a greater rate than the value of the education. And now who cares about scholarships? All of a sudden, this idea that you're going to accomplish gender equity through legislation and regulation falls flat. It's over. And it highlights, I think, back to the women's soccer and men's soccer pay differential, that you can try your best, but you can't beat the free market. And why is that? Because in the end, the free market is simply a collection of choices, of individual choices. If more people want to watch Kristen Pulisic than Megan Rapino, then they will. And you can't tell them they can't. If less people want to watch Alex Morgan than... Uh, uh, Ricardo Pepe, who you've never heard of, but I can promise you is a good soccer player, then they won't, no matter how much you force feed it onto television or in ticket sales. And if more people want to get college golfers to come to one school versus the other, no scholarship limitations is going to be able to, to limit the collection of individual choices that is the free market. You can't force gender equity if people don't choose to view things equally. And they shouldn't. That's the price of freedom, individual choice. You can't beat the market. All right, what a big episode today, a, lot, a fun episode. Had a good time with my friend Pete Hegseth and a fascinating interview with Congressman Chip Roy. Go download, give it a five-star review wherever you get your audio entertainment. Leave a comment on YouTube. We'll always bring your comments 
into the show here. You can email us at willcainepodcast at fox.com or hit me up on X at Will Kane or Instagram at cwillcain and Will Kane Show on all of those platforms. Go hit subscribe, YouTube, Instagram, and X. I'll see you again next time.